let's take a closer look at what we can do with the IO Express control panel. So when we exit Final Cut Pro and actually click on the IO Express control panel, you'll notice that it's actually going to reset the format to what's been set in the IO Express control panel application. Again, when Final Cut has control, it sets the frame buffer, but otherwise, the IO Express control panel settings set the frame buffer. So let's pull this up. And again, we can make these drop down or collapse by simply clicking on one of the tabs. So from left to right, let's just start with inputs. The first thing we know is that we've connected our VTR via SDI. Again, if we were to match the frame buffer format to the incoming video, this would appear in blue as opposed to red. And we'll cover that when we get to the next tab for format. The device has two inputs, either SDI or HDMI. When it comes to the reference jack, it can be configured either for reference and genlock input or for LTC input. You'll also notice we have an audio input selection for the embedded audio from channels 1 through 8 or 9 through 16. The most common is 1 through 8 because most devices don't output more than 8 channels of embedded audio. When we map channels, that's actually saying 1 to 2, or we can even map these across the board from 3 to 4 to 1 to 2, so on and so forth. Next, we're going to go to the Format tab. And again, we have the format set to 1080i 2997. You'll notice that if I switch this to 720p 5994, again, just as if Final Cut had control, it will go blue for our format and no longer be red. That's because I've matched the incoming video signal that's been detected to the actual frame buffer format, which is set by the primary format. We can also set a secondary format. In this case, the IO Express can down convert as a version 7.1 software. So in this case, we'll select 525i 2997 as a secondary format. And we'll go into deeper detail about the down conversions, which can be letterbox, crop, or anamorphic. Next, we'll go to the digital out. And we'll cover again, primary or secondary. So based on your selection here, this is what you'll actually output from the device. So if I select secondary, you'll notice that a down convert symbol goes between the primary format of the frame buffer and the actual output video signal. Again, it's as easy to do a down conversion as to toggle this one little radio button. If I go back, I'm outputting the primary signal. Analog out. If we look at this tab, again, we have a primary and a secondary. And depending upon which format we're outputting, that component video could be either component RGB, RGB HV, or component SMPTE EBU N10. For most HD levels, you'll be selecting SMPTE EBU N10. In some cases, if you were down converting, you might actually be selecting component beta. Again, this has to do with the levels in terms of IRE, whether it's 0 or 7.5. 0 for HD, 7.5 for NTSC. Next, we'll go to the HDMI tab. In the HDMI tab, we can only accept actual HDMI video. This means that it can't come from a source like a graphics card or a game console or something with encrypted signal. You'll also notice that by default, we select the SMPTE value range and not a full range because most video signals will be coming to you in SMPTE range. Audio in selection, you'll notice that we have a selection between paired channels. Most devices only send two channels if they're a source that's not encrypted. So again, the default selections are the obvious choices. You'll also notice that HDMI output has again the primary and secondary. You'll also notice there are color space selections so that they're auto detecting. And in the case of this device, we're using HDMI 1.3a which means we can do both 8-bit and 10-bit output, which in the case of this particular example, we're connected to an HP Dream Color monitor, so that's actually how we'd like to output that signal. Again, audio channels on playback. You can select two channels, which some devices will only receive, or eight channels for more sophisticated and modern HDMI devices. Again, SMPTE or full range for the output video range. And in this case, on output, some monitors can actually receive signal as DVI 
as opposed to HDMI via an adapter cable. Again, not for input, but for output, this protocol is acceptable. So let's take a look at setting the secondary output for the HDMI, and you notice that we get our down convert symbol, and if we go from here and look over to our monitor, we actually have a down converted output. While we're looking at this monitor, let's take a look at what happens when we actually go through the various settings. Right now we're in letterbox, but we could also be in a crop, where we would lose the left and right hand sides of the image, or we could be anamorphic, where we've actually squeezed the image to fit into the 4x3 space. Your deliverable could be any one of these, or perhaps even all three. So a major advantage of having the down conversion is not only for monitoring, but also for deliverables. Now let's take a look at the control tab. You'll notice that right now we've been outputting a test pattern. There are several options for the default video output. Test pattern gives us the ability to put out color bars. 75% color bars, 100% color bars, black, ramp, multi-burst, line sweep, multi-pattern, and flat field. All of these are extremely useful for both calibration and for actual diagnosis of your monitor or video signal. You'll also notice that the default video output can also be set to input pass-through. This essentially turns the IO Express into a type of converter that's connected to your computer. So you could in essence use it to do things like perform a standalone down conversion or to do something like simply monitor analog audio from a digital only source. Hold last application basically says that any settings that you've selected in an app like say Final Cut Pro or any of the other apps that are QuickTime enabled will actually hold that application's output and not flip back and forth between say the test pattern and the application. You'll also notice that there are Genlock timing selections. So for playback, this can be particularly valuable. There's a free run setting, which you could use in almost every instance. This basically means you use the internal clock of the AJA product. If you use reference in, you're using an external source for that reference, like house sync. So in a larger facility, this might be a selection that you'd make. For video in, you might be in an SDI type environment where you actually want to lock to the incoming video. You'll notice that it denotes 720p5994, again because that's the format that's actually coming in on that SDI pipe into the system. You can even adjust the horizontal and vertical timing of the signal, which is particularly valuable when you're applying analog reference video. Next, let's take a look at the setup tab. There's adjustments for the analog black level, which could be particularly useful if you're in, say, Japan, where the level might be zero as opposed to 7.5 IRE. You'll also notice the active video out filter. In Final Cut Pro, for example, there's only 100 actual video outputs that are available. So in order to manage that list, you might want to turn on or off any of these items, or you might just want to delineate them because you only work in, say, a 60 hertz environment. These are reasons why you might check or uncheck these boxes. It's also a reason why you might have a particular easy setup in Final Cut Pro and it says no video output through the AJA product. So a good place to keep in mind is these check boxes and whether they're checked or unchecked. Lock audio gain to Unity basically says that your level adjustment through the actual system is not affected if you've got this box checked. Analog audio monitor level, for professional stuff, it's typically 24 dBU, but you might have consumer devices which might be as low as 12. For other markets like Europe, you might have 18, and for Germany in particular, you might have 15. In order to navigate the tabs that are visible, you simply click on the arrows to move you from left to right. So our next item will be the Kodak tab. Codec has the ability to do our 24 to 30 frame per second conversion and what pattern will be used. The typical telecine pattern is 2-3-2-3. Another pattern is the one that's used inside a Panasonic's environment, which is 2-3-3-2. And then finally, a much more esoteric pattern, which is 2-2-2-4. This can also be offset for your playback. Video out can be paused on a full frame where you actually see field jutter. If you don't want to see this, you can step to single frame, and then each frame will only be displayed as a single field on the output. 
The next tab is time code. And you'll notice that right now we have incoming time code from the VTR. This time code data is actually something that we can read embedded in the SDI signal. We can even read the user bits and it'll tell us exactly what frame rate that material is coming into the system. This is extremely useful for VFR if you're trying to identify a particular frame rate on a tape. You'll also notice that we have a quick time time code output capability where we can even read the time code and produce a window burned output. So again, very useful information for post-production for making tape duplications. Next, we have the info tab, which is the last tab from the control panel. And you'll notice that it lists the ID for the product. It also provides you with the serial number of the product. This way you don't have to actually remove the product to learn its serial number. It also gives you the library components which can be extremely valuable if you're missing any of these because someone's inadvertently removed one, it'll light up in red and say, missing. You'll also notice that if you scroll down through the list, if there are any possible conflicting elements in the QuickTime components from another system, they'll actually light up in red and tell you that you may have a possible problem. Again, this is most useful for the tech support if you ever need to call in and tell someone what your configuration is or to possibly identify a possible problem. So this is a general overview of the IO Express control panel application.